So this is the book. It came out just at the end of October and it's been pretty slow <laughs> because of lots of supply chain issues right now. I wrote it to, to it's a, it's a collection of essays all about wildness. And by that, I mean, you know, like wildness as an eater, as a hiker, as a mother, as a, a liver in the world, as a, you know, a, a, just all the ways that wild spectacle has been a part of my life. Um, I, there's lots of, the, the essays are divided into three parts. The first part mostly takes place in Montana because that's where I came of age as a writer and a nature focused writer. The middle part are more far flung and I'm gonna read you like a six or seven minute section from that right now. And then the last part is, um, uh, I think Sammy's gonna talk to you more about this, but I quit flying because of the climate about a dozen years ago. And so the, the entire last part are, are journeys into wildness and amazing things that I've seen, but all closer to home or more internal and so forth. So in um, maybe in the, it's in somewhere in the 2000s, uh, I was asked by John Huey, who ran the, the Environmental Leadership Center at Warren Wilson College to, to go on a trip to Belize. So one of the things I probably would have traveled much more in my life, but I was raised on this junkyard in South Georgia. And so funds, you know, resources financially were always an issue for me. But John actually asked me to go, you know, like my job was to write, to be the scribe for this trip. And I found Belize to be an amazing place. So I want to read you just a few pages that took place while I was there. This morning, four of us have hired a bird guide, sight unseen. We've been hearing about Belize's bird guides. The birdmen of Belize are famous, legendary, trained for their, for their work as for any job and licensed. A rumor has circulated that Belize's Ministry of Nature is also its Ministry of Tourism, which would be amazing if it's true. Your guide will be Reuben, the woman at the lodge had said. Is he good? Reuben knows birds, she said. Soon Reuben, well-dressed in outdoor gear and freshly shaven, his hair impeccably combed, arrives to lead us off into the darkness. He can't be more than 21, too young for a naturalist, I think. When I was his age, I could hardly name 10 birds. Ready, Reuben says, wasting no time, although sunrise is a half hour away. Within a few strides on a rough machete cleared trail leading toward the temple of the jaguar, Reuben spots a Northern water thrush hopping ahead on the ground. All I see is a blue gray blur as the warbler flips under a disappearing coverlet of night. Did you see it? Whispers Doug, a jokester in his 60s. I shake my head, grimacing. I've got to get faster with the focus. You can see it back home, Doug says. It'll be leaving soon. Early March, the migrating song songbirds have not yet left their wintering grounds. That's not good enough. I want to see everything. Now, I'm here to see everything. Within seconds, Reuben cocks his ear toward a croaking and says quietly, yellow bill cacique. I, of course, have never heard of it. He pa Reuben pauses long enough for all of us to focus. And this time I get a good look at a blackbird with a startling yellow green beak and a golden eye. So many of the birds of Belize are not migrants and can never be seen where I live in Georgia. This is not gonna be a lazy stroll. I hitch up my cargo pants and pull out a pad. I start scrolling a record as we march onward and within a literal minute, Reuben has pointed out a red-throated ant tanager. I've always been in love with the world as long as I can remember.
Even as a kid, I found peace in nature. I could never find among people. When I was in college, someone taught me that pishing, making that whispery pish, 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 will attract birds, especially in the spring. One evening sitting under a low hanging laurel oak, I called in a yellow rumped warbler, as I later learned from a field guide, to within a few feet of me. I held my breath, amazed. Somehow that flying ode with its fine cloak of feathers held all the wisdom that could be learned. After that, I wanted to know the birds. One year at the Florida Folk Festival, I noticed a little boy standing near the Cajun tent at the edge of a grove of live oaks, his sweaty little fist held up in the air. He couldn't have been more than three feet tall, maybe five years old, wearing thick glasses, his face scrunched in hopefulness. Something about the child's face arrested me. Hi, I said. In the tent, the Cajun fiddlers were jumping. Without speaking, the little boy turned his face fully toward me and opened his hand. In his cupped palm was a half teaspoon of moist millet and a sunflower seed or two. His eyes were dazzling. I knelt down. I had no idea where his parents were. I'm sure they were watching. Wonderful, I said. Have any come? Not yet, he said, but one time a bird came. I hope lots do. As the years passed, I knew more and more birds by sight and a few by sound. I was, however, never a natural birder. I never fell asleep with a bird guide open on my lap. Instead, every day I'd have to start over. Which of the vultures, turkey or black, had silver tips on the wings? Black. Which had the red head? Turkey. How to tell a Carolina chickadee from a black cat? More gray on the outer tail feathers of the Carolina. I always had to work at birding. I have the heart for it, but not the mind. And these Belize birds, I could have never dreamed into existence. The pale-billed woodpecker, squirrel cuckoo, blue ground dove, keel-billed toucan, red lurid Amazon, black-headed saltator. They get more and more razzle-dazzle, collared aracari, northern bent bill, brilliant and alive, their names radiant and tumultuous, chachalaca, violaceous trogon, blue-crowned motbot, bright-rumped adela. Not only does Reuben recognize the birds by call, he identifies them by song. Every bird we hear, he names. How many do you know? I ask. More than 500. How did you learn them? I was trained to be a bird guide in Belize City, he says. I study hard. You're an excellent birder, I said. So let me skip a little section here and wind this up. I just have a piece of a, a page here. Um, we reach a place where the foot trail meets a, a road and we travel along it. Archaeological workers pass heading to work at the Lamini ruins. We are within walking distance of the Mayan ceremonial center where ancient temples are being uncovered by platoons of workers. From the passenger window of one of the pickups, a man speaks to Ruben. Pajarero, he says, by way of greeting. Pajaro is bird. Caballo is horse with arrow added, it becomes caballero or horseman, cowboy. I look at Ruben, bird man, I, I ask. Si, sí, he says, somos pajareros. We are bird men, bird fanciers. What I didn't know is that in colloquial use, the word also means happy people. Hold on, Ant, army ants sail by with their scraps of leaves and we skirt a swarm of killer bees living in a tree. Flocks of wild parrots, animals I've only seen in cages until this miraculous moment fly overhead like they used to do in the Southern US, Carolina parakeets. 
In the treetops is where parrots belong. And then Reuben spots a toucan, a bird every school child knows from coloring books, perched on a limb, completely at home in the jungle. My mouth is hanging open. Later, I will fidget with my journal under a strangler fig burdened with fruit at the feet of the sacred temple of the jaguar, looking up into branches thick with warblers, magnolia, magnolia Kentucky, prothonotary. Soon these birds will return to their nesting grounds, my homeland. I know them better now that I've seen their other country, the other side of their world. That's it, the Birdmen of Belize. Thank you. Denise, did you wanna ask folks to uh, put in the chat box really quickly some of their favorite wild places they've been recently? That would be great. Or your favorite bird, I'd love to see that too. Thank you, Dana, for that reminder. I also want to show y'all that here's a Malaprops bookmark that was in my book. <laughs> How cool is that? Awesome. Well, one of my favorite wild places I've been recently is just my backyard. <laughs> it's amazing what you can see in your backyard in the southeastern U.S. Um, all right, well, let's kick it on over to Sammy uh, to read from We Are All Climate Hypocrites Now. Sammy? Hey, so I'm, I'm following that. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you all a secret, right? So this is my first book reading of any kind, which makes it my first uh, virtual book reading too. Um, and uh, I asked Janice to go first because I figured I'd be nervous and now I'm extra nervous. So, so there's that. But I will echo Janice's thoughts that um, one, huge thanks to Malaprops. It is like, it's a highlight of any visit to Asheville. Uh, my mother is actually visiting from England next week um, and she's gonna be sad we're not gonna be in Asheville because that's like her favorite spot to go pick up. Uh, not just books, but like random, like politically themed, like breath mints and other, other such uh, fun, fun things you find in a store like that. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you to Dana for hosting and thank you, Janice, for your uh, fabulous reading. Um, I, I recently sat in woods alone on a Sunday evening uh, watching a hummingbird uh, feeding on a cardinal flower and it was just terrific. Like it was just a, a beautiful, beautiful, well-spent evening um, with a cold beer, which was just uh, topped it off nicely. Um, so let me start by saying this. So um, like Janice, I once vowed never to fly again. Um, I then promptly fell in love with a woman on the other side of the Atlantic, and I've been flying regularly ever since um, and feeling terrible about it. Um, I suspect a lot of kind of climate aware or climate conscious, climate anxious, insert your favorite sort of uh, adjective there, climate aware folks um, have uh, uh, are familiar with the predicament I'm kind of describing here is that we would all like to move to a world beyond fossil fuels. Um, and yet we have no choice but to live in a world that is powered by fossil fuels and that incentivizes high emissions behaviors. Uh, so we end up in this position where our values sort of almost inevitably end up having some tension with, with uh, the world we live in. Um, and, and that's a challenge. So you'll be pleased to know that the book, the book I wrote, um, got to do the, got to do the book. So we're all climate hypocrites now. It doesn't come with all these sticky notes. Um, those you have to pay extra for. Um, but the, the book I wrote is not just my voice and it's not just my experiences and my opinions. I spent a lot of time speaking to people much smarter than myself um, about how we navigate this kind of conflict. Um, and one of the folks I spoke to is a lady called uh, Julia Steinberger. She's actually an IPCC author, which means she helps put together those big UN reports that help inform things like the, the COP26 uh, negotiations that are going, going on in Glasgow right now. What she told me is that she cannot stop thinking about this idea that we are tiny creatures that are forced to interact with gigantic monsters who are using us to destroy the world. And like, I, I loved that phrasing. It was literally like, it sums up everything I think about what it, what it means to sort of be an individual in this climate crisis. I, I mean, I love it so much, I'll say it again. I'll probably rephrase it in entirely different terminology here, but we are tiny creatures who are forced to interact with gigantic monsters and those gigantic monsters are using us to destroy the world. 
And what that says to me is kind of it's, it's a reframing of what our role and our responsibility is within this crisis. We're not without agency and we're not without responsibility, but we are also subject to forces that are much, much larger than ourselves. Um, but I'm going to back up a little bit. So I, clearly, I spend a lot of time sitting around worrying about the climate crisis and what my responsibility is within this. I've been active in climate circles since my teens. Um, I am now no longer in my teens. Um, and uh, for the past 15 years, I've been writing for a website called treehugger.com, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it is a website that is focused on um, it is focused on green living and sustainable living and sustainable design. Uh, I've written, like Dana said, about everything from e-bikes to electric cars to uh, which way round you should hang your toilet paper to create the least amount of waste. Um, I did bring a prop just to show you. So just for the record, this is the correct way to hang your toilet paper to save the planet. Now, if you happen to be a public health expert, they will tell you that this is the correct way to prevent cross-contamination. Um, and I will tell you that I actually don't give a shit one way or the other. Um, this whole book project came out of a frustration of conversations like that uh, and out of a certain sense of um, uh, disillusionment with this idea that we're going to solve the climate crisis through individual action alone. And I thought the book was going to be about debunking the idea of individual action as being central to the fight against climate change. Uh, what I came to discover was, was that I was wrong. And I've got, I've got a short section here that I was going to read. It's very short. And then I'm going to jump to a, a different section. Um, but I think this kind of um, sums up the, the basic premise behind the book. So um, I'm going to start here. So here's the uncomfortable and inconvenient truth. The vast majority, majority of environmentalists, myself included, are doing more than most of our peers. I've gone to great efforts to install insulation in our 1936 home, for example. I drive an old, used, and somewhat ugly electric car. I often ride an e-bike around town. And I've cut back on my meat eating considerably. By the way, I'm not going to tell you what I had for dinner. Dana knows I'm in trouble. Um, yet an unfortunate mix of societal influences, the car-centric sprawl of the region I now call home, my socioeconomic status, and my own all-too-consumerist failings mean that I'm only doing a fair to middling job at actually cutting my emissions. The last time I calculated, my footprint was only some 25 to 30% lower than the US average, meaning it's also several orders of magnitude higher than your average global citizen. I would hazard a guess that many of my eco-minded peers are experiencing similarly mediocre results. When I first started working on this book, I intended to debunk the idea that individual action was central to creating change at all. I made a note to myself about what I thought was a useful analogy. The transatlantic slave trade didn't end because people stopped eating sugar, yet it turns out that this is only half true. In fact, sugar and rum boycotts were a key strategy of abolitionist groups. At one point, some 400,000 people in Britain alone were said to be boycotting slave-grown sugar. Contrary to my ill-informed assumptions, boycotts were actually pivotal in shifting the political dynamics of slavery. They helped make the moral case for abolition. They gave individual citizens a tangible way to live their values in their daily lives. And they exerted a direct economic pressure on the powerful forces that were profiting from business as usual. Yet the abolitionists promoting boycotts weren't suggesting that nationwide abstinence from sugar was the ultimate solution to ending slavery. Instead, they were tactically pulling the lever of abstinence with a specific end goal in mind. And they were doing so as part of a broader set of strategies. The lesson for those of us trying to mobilize on climate is not to ignore questions about what we should or shouldn't be doing in our personal lives. Rather, it's to rethink why those actions matter. So, um, Broadly speaking, that's the idea behind the book, right? It's not whether individual ma action matters or not. It's why does it matter? What can we learn from why it matters as to how we do it, what, what we do about it? Uh, and what I'm kind of arguing is that it's less about personal responsibility as an act of virtue or an act of kind of eco-perfection and more about an act of strategic mass mobilization. So it's about coming together and finding those points where the actions we take can have knock-on effects that ripple through society. Um, and there's, there's two reasons why I think that's important. The first is that, that it helps us move past uh, sort of unattainable or unrealistic demands for purity. I'm sorry, my light keeps sort of buzzing in and out a bit, so I'm going to adjust and see if that helps. So, so one is we can move past some of these unrealistic demands for purity that too often kind of derail the movement. Um, you know, are, are you vegan enough, right? Are you not flying enough? All of those, those things that become very, very destructive when not, when not handled carefully and uh, with some compassion. 
Uh, and the second is it allows us to, uh, to focus and prioritize our efforts to those places where we can really shift the system. So we're not on these individual journeys to cut our own personal carbon footprint to zero. Instead, we're on kind of a collective journey to, to move the only carbon footprint that matters, which is the carbon footprint of society as a whole. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is by finding really specific and strategic leverage points and tipping points that will, will move the needle in our direction. Um, there was a third reason that I thought was going to be part of the book, um, which is that I thought it would also help us move past some of the guilt that many of us feel, right? Like many people, I feel guilty all the time about the things I am not doing, right? I feel bad if I spend too long in the shower. I feel kind of horrible about what I had for dinner tonight. Um, but, but what I quickly realized is actually guilt and shame are not necessarily a problem. We just have to learn about how we use them and where we use them. So Brene Brown might disagree with me on this. Um, but, but again, I spoke to people much smarter than myself. Um, uh, one of the folks I spoke to is a lady called Jennifer Jackway, who wrote a book called Is Shame Necessary? I highly, highly recommend it. Um, get it at Malaprop's bookstore. Um, it is uh, essentially a re-examination of, of what the function of shame is. And what, what Jennifer, Jennifer told me is that... Um, shame and guilt are really powerful social regulators. Society would look super unhealthy if we did not have shame and if we did not have guilt. Uh, the problem is not that they exist. The problem is that they are often misplaced or placed in the wrong place. Um, and she specifically talked to me a lot about shaming and this idea that, that shaming, the way she describes it is shaming is like antibiotics, right? Super powerful, super useful, but use them too broadly, too widely or where they're not needed and they lose their potency for when they are needed. So, so the example I give in the book is work that actually Dana and I did together. And it's, it's a little bit unfortunate that Dana is on the line because she can correct all the things I'm about to get wrong about timelines and specifics. Um, but about 13 years ago, we took a uh, Dogwood Alliance took on Kentucky Fried Chicken um, for their unsustainable paper and packaging policies. So they were buying paper from uh, bottomland hardwood forests, which are super important biodiverse ecosystems here in, in the southeast United States. And they were using it to, to, you know, essentially chop it up and turn it into buckets for fried chicken. Um, and what we did is we deployed shame very, very carefully and very, very strategically. We essentially took the picture of the colonel, made him look like a super mean guy and stuck a chainsaw in his hand. Um, and what that created was this negative impression around the one true thing that KFC has going for it, because chicken isn't all that good. Right. Well, the one thing they have going for it is the kernel and this kind of aura of, of wholesome southern, um, you know, we can get into all of the other connotations of, of, of that aura. But, but it, it allowed us to, to ding them where it hurt and get them to pay enough attention that all of a sudden it didn't make sense for them to be buying paper from bottomland hardwood forests anymore. And the result of that campaign was not only did KFC and Yum Brands, which is their parent company, change their paper and packaging policies, but ultimately international pulp and paper, which I think is the second or third largest paper company in the world, um, ended up changing how they manage forests across the entire Southeast United States. So that was an example where shame was deployed really strategically and really carefully. Um, and what I'm arguing for is, is, is shame and guilt they're not bad or good, they're tools, like anger, like fear, like hope, like inspiration. And we need to learn how to use them where they make sense and move away from them where they hold us back. And too often shame and shaming hold us back because we're too busy pointing the finger at each other. And any time spent pointing the finger at each other is not pointing the finger at Joe Manchin. Uh, so there's, there's reason to focus your efforts and, 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 and think through, play through how these things are gonna um, achieve the goals you're, you're seeking to achieve. So I'm going to do one quick final reading. It's a, just a, a couple of pages here, and then I'm going to be done and we can throw out some questions. If anybody is feeling particularly hypocritical or guilty, you are welcome to use the chat function to confess any of your eco sins. I cannot absolve you, but I can uh, commiserate along with you. Um, so here's what, here's what we're going to start. And I'm going to jump a little bit because we don't need to read all of this. Um, but um, excuse me. So... Here's the premise, right? So recognizing that our behaviors are shaped by the structures that we inhabit isn't about passing the buck. And accepting our imperfections isn't about assuaging our guilt or giving ourselves excuses to keep on doing as we please. It's simply about becoming more effective as activists. By embracing our supposed hypocrisies, we undermine the arguments of our opponents, those who would use our shortcomings as an excuse for doing nothing. More importantly, in doing so, we are able to get a better handle on exactly what the path to society-wide decarbonization might look like. 
The point is not to ignore what we can and should be doing in our personal lives. Instead, it's to see those actions within the true context that gives them both meaning and power. And that's in how they help shape the world around us. My suggestion for anyone looking to make a difference is to start not with a generic top 10 list of how to cut your carbon. It's not even to focus on your own carbon footprint at all. Instead, take a frank and honest look at where you have the greatest opportunity to create wider scale change. You'll have plenty of time to learn about how you are currently causing harm, yet I believe you should start with an expansive and ambitious view of where your unique power lies. So that's me done. Um, I'm gonna hand over to, I think, Dana, um, who may have a thought or two, because Dana often has some very good thoughts. <laughs> Back to me again, and that was just awesome, Sammy. Thank you both so much. Um, we had a question from the audience, but I'm going to hold that uh, until we get there. We, I, I had a couple of questions that I wanted the two of you all to just chew on. Um, and Sammy, in the chat box, when you were asking about climate confessionals, uh, Janice said she's thinking about flying again after 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> and that she's been invited on a trip to Europe that she'd really like to do. And uh, I know, Sammy, this is one of the things in your book that you talk about how you tried to stop flying but failed. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear Janice's voice and to hear you, you guys just discuss amongst yourselves about the importance of ind individual action and, and also about its limitations. Because I know on a personal level, we all wanna do something and we're all trying to reduce our own footprint on the planet. And at the same time, it's just damn near impossible to be, uh, to reduce it to a point of zero. Um, so can y'all just reflect on that for a minute with us? Sure. Um, Janice, do you, want to, do you want to start by talking about your-, your... Well, so, so Sammy, I'll start and then, pass the mic to you. I look at it. So I, so this, this is an old, old conversation, you know, uh, individual change versus, um, why policy change. And I, you know, I've gone back and forth. I'm completely on the side of policy change, but I think, I do think like you, I think individual change is, is necessary for a couple of reasons. And, and one is when you have a collect a collective trauma, which is so the climate crisis is a collective trauma. A collective trauma is made up of a lot of personal traumas, and the way to heal is you have to heal the personal trauma, but you also have to heal the collective trauma. And I think that's where the division comes in. I think that policy changes across the globe are absolutely necessary to heal the collective trauma. And I think that we have to make decisions for ourselves, for the individual. And then just one other thing, and that is, I stopped flying because I was traveling across the country doing talks. I would fly to Portland to, to, be, to speak to 25 people in a bookstore or, you know, 40 in a university. And I was not, I felt as if I was living a lie. I was not walking the talk. When you don't walk your talk, that is, that lie is a kind of mental illness. And I just couldn't do it anymore. So, I, it's a, I think we live on these spectrums of how sustainable. I don't think there's anything we could be doing right now that's more important than figuring out where we fit on that spectrum and how we can be moving always toward greater and greater sustainability. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. I was just fascinated with your entire talk and just wanted to say that, that I'm not going to choose one over the other. It's got to be both, but there are reasons for both. Sure. I think your example is a super interesting one, right? Because one of the things that I hope, what I worried about when writing the book was that it becomes like a, um, uh, an excuse to carry on just doing what you want to do, right? Oh, we're all hypocrites. So let's just, let's just roll. And really the opposite is true, right? Is that we all have these opportunities. The more you fly, the more impact you can have by not flying or by flying less. Right. So if you're flying all over the world to, to or all over the US to give your talks, like 
sure, that starts getting like there's a tension there. But equally, like, I think we each have to, as you said, find that place where you specifically feel comfortable, right? Mm-hmm. And we're, we're, we're inevitably going to have some tension, right? We're inevitably going to have places where we either fall short because literally because of the systems or sometimes because we just have desires and wants and we're human beings. I want to go see my mom, right? I want to go and drink real beer in England, you know, um, no offense to American beer, but um, so there's, there's an element of what I hope to paint the picture of is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing and that we can find these specific points of leverage. So if you go from, you know, five flights a year to one every five years, that's like 99% of the job done. And if you take that flight, like I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't, but I, I just think those are those places where we get to have a more nuanced conversation that actually brings more people on board. I very much admire those who ne- will never fly again. I think it's cool as shit. Um, but I also think that's much easier to do if you live in Sweden than it is if you live in Southeast United States, right? Like flying to New York is, is much easier and probably not that much more polluting than taking Amtrak. You know, so it's just it's it's all so context specific that um, I, I think the healthiest thing we can do is discuss it, and I think you know find those places and also just not beat ourselves up when we do decide to make choices that aren't one hundred percent consistent with with where we'd like to go. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, the guilt around this, and and Janice, you talked about this, Sammy, you talked about this a little bit, just the sadness that comes along with living in an ecological crisis where we know that human behavior has, um, has gotten us here, you know, our overconsumption of resources and our, you know, the lifestyles that we live. And we know that that's happening and it, and it, and it's sad and the grief is real. Um, but you both interesting in your books have, an antidote to this kind of phenomenon known as climate grief or ecological crisis grief. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the anecdote to that? Because I think that, um, you know, as people are feeling the sense of wanting to do something, uh, action is the, 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 be- the best anecdote or just sitting in nature can be an anecdote. So can you all just describe a little bit of from your perspective and what you've written about in these amazing books, um, what you're describing as some of the ways to deal with that guilt, the feeling of guilt. Well, I'll start if you don't mind, Sammy. And, sure. and there, I, just, I wanna say that it's, it's much harder to destroy something that you don't personally know or that you don't love. You know, it's, it's how we demonize entire groups of people. You know, we don't know, uh, we don't know Latin migrant farm workers in our personal lives. And so we can classify them in these certain ways. And yeah, so I definitely would make a case for getting out in nature because the more you realize that you are it and it is you, the harder it becomes to, to consciously do something against it. Yeah. Mm. Very good point, that, Sammy. Well, I think that's evident in, in your, I mean, I love the book, Janice. I think that the writing in it is like, it's, it's one, it's just really, you know, as a word nerd, it's just like, it's kind of stops you in your tracks have to read a few sentences over again, right? But but this idea of just stopping and enjoying the beauty of things is also part of just recognizing interconnection, right? That um, there's a, a writer, um, she she's, she has been on the board of Dogwood Alliance, uh, Mary Heglar, she's a climate essayist, a podcaster. One of the things she says when asked about what what we can, what's the most important thing we can do as individuals um, and her response was something along the lines of stop thinking about ourselves so much as individuals, right? And that's true uh, sort of interspecies and intraspecies, right? Like it's, it's true when, we, when you connect with that bird or, or that birder, right? Um, but it's also true in terms of how we think about, okay, what's my role? The, my carbon footprint is less important than my, uh, there's a term carbon handprint, right? Like my influence out on society is more important than my specific scorecard of how bad I've been this week, right? Um, so, so the more we can recognize those interconnections and what we do with that is going to be different depending on the person, but how do we 
find that place where we're we're playing that dance with everything around us uh, you know that includes all the humans around us but also the our non-human you know our non-human neighbors so sammy let me jump in with a question here to you because you wrote this great book on climate so comprehensive um so so we just we sat through you know the glasgow uh, a conference, the summit, and 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 so what are like if we can't get our nation to move, like what are we supposed to do, you know, like so so if we think less of the ind individual and we think more about what we as a people do, so coming out of the summit, what were your th what are your thoughts on that? Like how did you take in all that? It's, that's really interesting. And I think Dana may have some things to say on this too, right? Mm -hmm. Is that I think there's this constant tension of, on the one hand, that summit did not go anywhere near fast enough. There was far too many fossil fuel powers there. You know, the, what's coming out of there is not what is needed within the crisis we have. And also we can recognize that we are streets ahead of where we were in Copenhagen 10 years ago, right? And the reason we are, or 15 years ago now, but uh, 12, uh, <laughs> Math is not my strong point, but but the reason where we are, why we are where we are is because of this mass mobilization movements that are happening, right? Like the and not just the youth movement. Everyone talks about the youth movement, but I'm not really sure it is a youth movement. I think the youth have been a, a super important part of it, but actually there are a bunch of boomers out there doing doing what needs to be done, um, and I think all of those folks together have really pushed the needle in the right direction. Um, I feel more hopeful than ever that we will get somewhere it's already too late to get where we should have been 20 years ago right like we're in for a world of hurt like that's there's no doubt about that we have you know we've already lost so much people are already dying i don't want to be sort of the you know it's all going to be fine but i do feel like what we see is real progress and you see that in terms of the work at dogwood in terms of the way that policy is changing in terms of the way that that climate is part of a conversation in a way that it's never been before um, exactly where we go i don't know Right. But but I think there is this there is a uh, I my inner little punk rocker cringe when I say an awakening going on. Uh, it's a little too hippie for my liking, but it's true. Right. Like there is a um, there is a coming together of folks that are really exerting power in ways and exploring new ways of doing things that I think uh, we're going to see incredible progress in the next 10 years. And the, the, the building box blocks are in place. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing, you know, if the, if the question is the biggest thing we can do is, is get involved, right? Get involved with Dogwood Alliance, get involved with whoever your local folks are and really just engage and start, start building collectives of power. Um, and then from there, you'll find a million different places where you can engage. I, I couldn't agree more, Sammy. And I think one of the things that's given me most hope right now at this moment are the intersection, the way that the movement is growing from an intersectional perspective. Um, the environmental justice and human rights components of climate change and all of this destruction of the environment and the communities that are bearing the brunt of the impacts of that are joining forces with scientists and climate activists. And, and so we really are seeing this like explosion of a movement right now uh, around climate change and protecting nature. And I love this. Shanna Grimes who's in the audience just uh, posted in the chat box. Nature does not hurry yet. Everything is accomplished. Lao Tzu. Um, really awesome. So, um, well, yeah, go ahead. I, this is just a question for you, and I'm sorry to interject it here. Recently, I saw a blog post by Mil Bill McKibben, who kind of, um, he talked about how trees were not as important for the climate crisis as, as, you know, I believe they are. And I know the last conversation that you and I had, you know, we focused a lot on this. So how... So did you see that? And, and so what is your response to that? You know, I think I, I did not see that, but Bill is a strong ally of ours. Um, yeah. And I think that the probably what he is referring to is how forests are currently being used in the fight for climate change um, and that that is not effective at all. 
So right now the status quo is sort of about planting a bunch of trees or offsetting fossil fuels with using forests. And both of those are false solutions. Um, what we That's really need to do is to, you know, is to leave as many trees and as many forests intact in the ground as possible. Um, and it's not because it's gonna offset fossil fuels, it's because forests are vital to pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, period. And the more forests we protect, the more carbon we can take out of the atmosphere. So even if we stopped emitting all the carbon tomorrow, we've still got 420 plus parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, which is um, way too much carbon. And without a mechanism for drawing that down, uh, we won't get to a safe level of carbon in the atmosphere for, to avoid catastrophe. So forests are vital part, but right now there's a lot of false solutions out there under the, under the guise of natural climate solutions that I think Bill McKibben was probably referring to. Yes, you're exactly right. And he was also re referring to a recent study that showed that many of those carbon offset programs, you know, like we'll plant these this many trees weren't actually like producing the work. So, no. yeah. Th thank you, Dana. That was very well said. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a shell game, uh, really, the carbon offset market. Well, let's go back to this. Um, so, you know, typically when we, we get books about climate change and the environment. They, they can often be very like science focused with facts and statistics and, you know, um, and, and both of you have a very different sort of um, vibe to your books. Um, you know, Sammy, you have like this dry wit and humor. Uh, Janice, you have this beautiful prose and almost poetic uh, writing about the mysteries and wonder of nature. And, you know, I'd love to hear y'all reflect on why you think it's important to appeal to more than just the, the rational scientific arguments at this point. Oh my gosh. Go ahead, Sammy, you wanna go? Sure, I can, I can jump in. And I, I think, I mean, I absolutely saw that in Janice's book and I, I recognize it in a really different way, right? Like there's this beautiful poetry and, and a lot of actual sort of belly laughs in there too, right? But one of the things I've learned from the climate crisis is how much fun you can have in the midst of all this destruction, right? Is that I think a lot of people don't want to engage on this topic because it is terrifying. And it is like the science isn't, you know, it's not pretty. I, I nearly wrote a chapter at the start that was like, here's where we are and ice caps are melting and polar. And I was like, anyone reading my book knows this shit, right? Like they know it, we know this. We need to move on from that and say, what do we do about it? Um, and the thing I've learned, you know, I've been doing climate activism for 25 years and I've met some of my favorite people in the world doing that work. Right, and not just because they care about the world, but because they're fun. They're funny. They're like you know, we sat up at midnight, just you know, putting the world to rights and enjoying ourselves and swapping our favorite songs. And all of that is a part of what we are fighting to preserve, which is human culture and human connection. Um, and whether that's through you know, I'm a class clown. I will have hold hands up to that, and I enjoy having a good time. I that that's my way of sort of um, connecting with people is humor and sort of disarming them. I th this, the same goes for sort of sitting down and going, holy shit, look at that hummingbird feeding on that cardinal flower. Not cardinal, that would be weird. Um, but <laughs> that, that would probably not be okay. Something's gone really wrong. Um, so it's, it's just that kind of like, we have to be able to hold this monumental task we've got ahead of us that we are gonna be in for the rest of our lives. There's no version of this that is solved by the time I die, right? We are going to be fighting this fight until our last breath, and then our children are going to be fighting it, and our grandchildren are going to be fighting it. So, what are we going to do other than, you know, find a way to sustain ourselves as we do it? You know. So, so the thing when I was studying with William Kittredge, the Western nature writer at the University of Montana, he said to remember that facts don't change people; it's emotions that change people. And so that's what I try to do in my work. You know, and it take in writing it, it takes you a few minutes to get to that. That's why you know it's hard to read a paragraph and actually elicit some emotion. So when I give readings, I do the same thing. Like my job is to get to the person's heart as quickly as possible. 
because it's in that heart that we all, no matter if we're driving the large SUV or the little, you know, electric Tesla, no matter, no matter what we do, we all in the center of our heart want the same things. We want healthy lives for ourselves. We want good families. We want a nice home, a comfortable home. We want, we want love. We want to belong. And so that's, and also, let me just say this. I believe in our heart of hearts. We also remember that when we were born, we were in love with the world. We were in love. We were in awe and in love with trees and birds and everything. And so if I come into an audience and I talk stats or I talk polarity, I lose a bunch of people. So I like to come in and really just talk heart and love. And that and emotions do it. Beauty of the beauty of words does it. You know, the potency of story does it. Yeah. Good question, Dana. So true. Um, well, I have one more question and then we're going to um, flip to the couple of questions we have in the chat box from the audience. Sammy, you talked about us being tiny beings fighting a monster. And Janice, when I read your book, I felt like a I, re- I was reminded that we are also tiny beings on this beautiful natural planet. And it just occurred to me that humility in the midst of being so tiny, that humility is such an important word right now. Uh, can y'all each just reflect on your perspective around the role of humility at this moment for human beings? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think what that brings to mind for me is this idea of uh, we hear a lot within climate circles that that this is what we have to do. Right. And I've, I've, we've all met these people. Right. We, you know, you can't be an environmentalist if you know, if it, you can't be an environmentalist, if you eat meat, you can't be an environmentalist, if you fly, you can't be an environmentalist, if whatever. My own view is the the only reason you can't be an environmentalist is if you tell other people they can't be an environmentalist, right? Um, And what we need to get to is a point where we understand that we are part of something that's much larger than ourselves. We have to find our place within it. We have to also, we don't, it doesn't mean we all have to get along. So I thought that was the lesson, right? So there's a section in the book where I talk about Amsterdam and the lesson of Amsterdam. So Amsterdam wasn't always this cycling city. For folks who've been there, um, it's an incredible cycling city now, like just millions of bicycles coming in and out of the, of the city station. They've got three stories of bike parking. Like it, it, you can get somewhere seven, you know, I think it's going to take, I think it's something like two and a half times longer to drive than it is to ride a bike, right? It's just a terrific city for bikes. But in the seventies, it was being taken over by the car. Uh, and they had this movement that, that stopped that and reversed it and built a cycling city. And I thought that meant we had to build a movement that all gets along. I don't actually think that's true. Because some of these folks were anarchists that were pushing cars into canals and scratching, you know, scra- scratching BMWs and all of this sort of uh, provocative behavior. And there were also historic preservationists and there were also, you know, um, car drivers who didn't want to be stuck in traffic. And they all played a role. They didn't all necessarily even coordinate, but they all played a role within that transformation. So I don't know if it's possible to see out in advance what the transformation we're about to live is. It really is. I I do know it is impossible, I should say, right? But we do know that it will involve something that is much bigger than ourselves and that our action within it will only play a part. So having some humility as to understand that I'm not going to be that, you know, and I know I'm a, you know, I'm a white dude, so I like to think everything revolves around me, right? But having some humility to understand that I will play some small part and things will roll, they will be outside of my control. And I also find that helpful in terms of the anxiety and the guilt and all of that too. It's just like, I am i didn't choose when I was born. I didn't choose the family I was born into. I didn't choose the place I was born into. What I did choose is what I do with what I've been given. And I think that's kind of, that's where humility comes in for me is just like sort of, sit have a little wonder at what this moment we're born into and then like let's go right yeah Janice what about yeah, you so 
And so I had, I I just have some conflicting thoughts about humility because I think, I think humility is so fine when it's in relation to, to something that's bigger than us and more important than us. But I also think that it gets confused with this act of, of, you know, like just keeping your mouth shut and and laying Mm -hmm. low. And so they're actually toward the end of the book. It says there's something that says most most of us, most of our lives are asked to live very small. Most of us never live the bigness that I know is possible. Mm. And, and so in that regard, I would not recommend humility. I would recommend, you know, building only humility in relation to something bigger than ourselves, but in relation to, to each other and our government, I think humility could be a mistake. And our, and our individual power really does matter. Um, that's, that's, can I just chime in on that? Because that's super interesting, right? Is like this idea of humility, humility and boldness don't have to be in conflict, right? We can have humility in the sense of, yeah. and, there, and it's also true that some people need more humility than others, right? <laughs> um, but we can have humility as to where our role is and still say, we're going to go as big as possible. Right. Like the, there's this element of like, I'm, I'm in this dance that's much bigger than myself, but I'm going to dance, you know? Absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's jump to some of the questions we have here. The first question that came up um, was what resources can small landowners access for protecting their properties in perpetuity from encroachment by industry, local taxes, and family values. We want desperately to save our farm habitats. Diana, I feel like you're most qualified to answer that one, or maybe Janice. <laughs> you know? Well, I will say that I want you too to save your farm habitat. And I know it's I know it's difficult. If you have a land trust nearby, you know, within a if you're if you are within the reach of a regional land trust, then I would go there and, and at least pursue a conservation easement. I have a friend who just did one on his farm. So it, it just means that it's his farm is not going to be developed, even though. He, he has no children and it will sell out of his family. You know, it's going to leave the, in this case, Johnson name. Yeah, that's all I know. It's, a, it's an issue. It's an issue in my life as well. Absolutely. And, and I think oftentimes, so there is the, the land trust issues and the conservation easements. There's also the importance of zoning and regulation, and that shouldn't be off the table either. And that's a little bit more difficult because it requires that collective action. It's sort of like this individual, as we were talking about earlier, this individual thing where I can do this one thing on my land and alleviate taxes through putting in a conservation easement. But if we could get some zoning that this is farmland uh, in, in a regulatory sense, then all of a sudden you've ha- you have a much bigger impact um, than you could just by doing it individually. So uh, the other question that's come up is, what is your perspective on the soil soils as a means for carbon sequestration? Uh, Kiss the Ground did a great documentary on this. Is this a viable solution for our industrial food? Sammy, I want you to take that. And let me just say the only thing I know is, is that, you know, I, I, I have been, I've been an activist to try to change our agricultural system for a long, long time. I live on a farm, you know, like I, I understand the value of carbon farming, for example, and, but you are going to know more of the answer than I do, just that I'm, I'm with you. Sure. Uh, so so I will preface it by saying I'm not a soil scientist and I'm not a climate scientist. What I will say is that soils and how we treat soils will be a huge part of how we tackle climate change. Uh, they are also much like trees to some degree being pushed as the solution, right? There's a book that a while back, I don't, I don't want to ding any one specific book, but it was called something like The Soil Will Save Us. And the title just annoyed the crap out of me because the soil isn't going to save us. The trees aren't going to save us. Nothing's going to save us. No one thing is going to save us. Um, so there are huge advantages to carbon farming and carbon friendly farming. There's some super cool stuff to look into in terms of biochar 
and uh, perennial crop farming. Um, all of these things have a massive potential to put carbon in the ground. The trouble from my understanding comes is the fact that carbon in the ground is not as stable as carbon way underground, right? Coal is a very, very stable form of carbon. Oil is a very, very stable form of carbon, unless you happen to live in a society that burns a ton of coal or oil, but who would be stupid enough to do that, you know? Um, so, so what I would say is I think there's super cool things going on. I think you should support uh, farmers and organizations and companies that are doing some really cool stuff. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff with perennial grains, for example. The, the Land Institute is doing some stuff with, I think it's called Kernza. Um, it's like a perennial grain. It tastes exactly like wheat, um, but they're using it in beer and things these days. Um, but I would also say that none of those things are a, um, are a replacement for the urgent need to keep the most stable carbon in the ground and not burn it to, to run out run our tractors on our perennial grain farms. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but but I, th I think so. Th there's, there's value in it. The other thing I will say is there's a super important need to verify whatever claims are being made. And there's a bunch of interesting uh, stuff going on right now in terms of carbon measurement and carbon verification, uh, because you can make a claim about carbon being in the soil, but one, what type of carbon is it? How long is it going to stay there? And what what mechanisms are in place to make sure that the next farmer doesn't change their land practices and it's straight up in the air again? Yeah, absolutely. Well, are there any more chats uh, from the audience in terms of questions? Do folks have any additional questions? Sammy or Denise, anything more that you want to uh, make sure the folks who are in the audience take from your book? There's one or two top lines that you're hoping people will walk away from tonight with, aside from, and everyone should absolutely purchase and uh, go out and purchase Wild Spectacle. And we're all climate hypocrites now. They're both wonderful reads. I've read both of them. They're amazing. Loved both of the books. And uh, everyone should definitely go out and get their copy. Uh, at Malaprops, um, is there... In closing, one or two things that you guys would really like. Um, Anna, I, I want to thank you for for being our host as host tonight. It's just you're you're such a powerful figure, and I so much appreciate your work with the Forest of the Southeast and Dogwood Alliance. So it's just like you know having my hero uh, on here. So thank you so much. You you've devoted your entire life to this work and. I recognize that and I deeply appreciate it. Sammy, I thank you for sharing the stage. I've had just a great time working with you. And thanks again to Malaprops and everybody who works there. And also thanks to everybody who came because it shows that you really care about what's happening to our atmosphere and, and to our forests and to our earth in general. So thank you. We do have a couple more questions if you guys are still up for, for it that just came in. Um, do you all have any other recommended readings? So I'm going to make, a, I actually recommended this to Dana the other day when we were having a conversation. This is not a book about the climate at all, but you should buy it from Malaprops too. Um, there's a book by a local Durham writer John Darnell of the Mountain Goats. His latest book, Devil House, is a fantastic read if you like crime horror with a deep <laughs> dose of compassion and kindness, which is not an easy thing to bring together. I was spellbound by it. I think it's a terrific novel, um, and I highly recommend that. Um, but if, if you're looking for more climate-friendly reading, um, I think Project Drawdown, uh, so the, I forget the name of the actual book, I think the book may be just called Drawdown, but it's a really terrific resource of looking on a global scale at what the solutions are going to be for climate and really sort of like try, it, it, it does lean it's less storytelling and it's more like it's the stats it's the rankings but it's a really useful picture of, of where you're going and then one sorry i'm going to ramble now because i love books but one more ministry of the future by kim stanley robinson is a terrific piece of speculative fiction it tells the story of how humanity solved climate change. I'm just looking back from, I think a hundred years from now or so. Um, and what I loved about it was exactly what we've been talking about here is that it tells a story of like no one thing solved it. 
And it wasn't painless. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was extremely painful and it was a long and arduous journey. But humanity gets to a point where things are starting to get get under control and it looks back as, as, as to how we get there. I'm sure what happens won't be what happens in that book, but I think there's a lesson in in that simple fact that, that we're part of something much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll throw in a couple. Um, Ginny O'Dale has a little book called How to Do Nothing. And, um, you know, the entire book is the, the first chapter is really the most useful part. And it and it's sort of like how to withdraw yourself, just how to be more mindful of the attention economy and that, you know, just the ways that social media is really marketing our attention our, you know, they need us there on social media. That's been very eye-opening for me. Um, in terms of climate, I would say the anthology that the Drawdown folks put together, which is called All We Can Save, it's just a beautiful anthology of women climate leaders from around the world. Yeah. And I, I, I have been reading so much during the pandemic, I could really go on and on and on, but I'll stop. Just those two. Those are awesome recommendations. Uh, okay, one last question, and that is in California, they're incorporating native plants into subsidy programs. That represents a huge impact on our farmlands and biodiversity. How fast can we put this practice, put this into practice in the Southeast? I love the idea. I've been following actually that the California native plant um, movement. It's pretty amazing out there. And yeah, let's bring it on. And I think there may yep. be some opportunity with this new infrastructure package that's just passed. Sammy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know of any specific efforts here to, to do the, the same kind of thing. Obviously we are in a slightly different legislative landscape to California. Um, as, as folks know, but I think it is interesting that that's one place where I think there is opportunity for common ground across sort of different, the different divides that we do deal with politically these days. Uh, it's been amazing to me how I moved here, what, 15 years ago to the States, I mean, from England, and how sort of roadside flower plantings and things weren't really a thing when I moved here. And, and they are now, like there aren't enough of them. There isn't anywhere near where we need to go, but there's there's a lot of really interesting work going on around the world to rethink what we do with land, right? If you look at some of the rewilding work in Europe, it's, it's super interesting, right? Of sort of really rethinking, not just whether we do conservation, but how we do it. Um, unfortunately, it too often involves giving aristocracy a ton of money to keep owning large houses, but that's a whole different political discussion we can have. Um, but I'm, I'm down if anyone has any, like if, if there's anyone in the chat who's got specific organizations working on it in the Southeast, I would love to see that because heaven knows our, our agricultural landscapes aren't the, the pastoral beauty that we'd like them to be. Absolutely. Um, we just got another question in. Uh, I just learned about the thermo power generation in Sweden. Do you think we should look towards that type of power? I don't actually know what that is. Are we talking about like district heating type stuff or geothermal or? Um, maybe the person, Shanna, who asked the question, do you know if it's geothermal power or? Don't know, didn't say. Okay. okay. I mean, I. Uh, if it's good, yes. <laughs> I do know in, in, the, in Nordic countries, they do have a lot of interesting stuff in the cities of um, district heating and things. In Helsinki, they're running like heating from data centers underground and then heating a bunch of apartment blocks. There's a bunch of cool stuff going on. So broadly, we can say like there's a ton. We have all the technologies we need to, if not get to 100%, you know, like zero emissions in the next 10 years, then pretty damn close. What we need is political will and organization and uh, to take some of those standing in the way out of the way. Um, geothermal. Yes. Um, to the best, I mean, I, I think the challenge with geothermal is it's very geographically limited, right? Like, so it works great in Iceland. Iceland's rocking it. 
but they, you know, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I think there are places in the United States where there's really strong geothermal. Um, I couldn't tell you where those are, maybe Colorado, um, but I, I, uh, it's beyond my pay grade to tell you what the potential <laughs> for geothermal is. In the You're US. right. I think, Sammy, it's very uh, geographic, geographically specific around where there's volcanic activity. Um, okay, so uh, Sammy, do you want to close us out? Thanks everybody so much for coming. This was awesome. I know Janice said some some words. Do you want to close close us out from your perspective, Sammy, before everybody drops off? Sure. I, I mean, I, I hate to r repeat and riff off of Janice, but there's there's worse people you can repeat and riff off of. So um, I, I will say thank you um, to 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 both of you. Uh, host and fellow uh, participant um it's been a real pleasure and an honor to be on you know this as i said this is my literally my first rodeo um it's been a lot of fun um and thank you to malaprops for 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 putting this on and for doing what you do for, what is it 39 years that's nuts um is to you know at least 39 more um and look forward to maybe having a meeting in 40 years where we look back on reaching net zero and beyond. Absolutely. Good night, everybody.